I preached uh, a message yesterday uh, at the Rise Scotland, and I was quite amazed how well received it has been. Um, you know, even people that I wouldn't have met thought weren't really into it have really been raving about it. Uh, and it was called Plant in the Heaven. So let's go to Isaiah 51. I'm going to cover this, I think, probably over the next few weeks. And we might dip in and out of it. I keep saying that in the Sunday mornings to our congregation, that when I kind of launch out on a series of, uh, type, a series of teachings, um, I do say that we might dip in and out, because sometimes the Lord will lead me and other things, but we do have we series, so started one this morning. But this one I want to start on the eleven fountain meetings, and it's planting the heavens. And again, you know, for Pete's sake, didn't mean it to, to sound like that for Pete's for Pete's sake, but for Pete's sake, Pete is in uh, one of my uh, students at Bible College, and so some of this stuff Pete will cover. It's one of the modules, again, like last week. It's one of the modules. Um, so I won't necessarily preach the actual lecture or lesson. And I did forget the notes tonight, but I'm not really going to touch into the notes tonight because I want to lay a foundation. I want to lay the basis of this because this is so, so important. What we did on Mount Zion the other day, formerly known as Shehalion, is very much in line with what I want to speak about. Because, and let's just get into it, in fact, Isaiah 51, and we'll just look a wee bit at that. As a basis, this is going to be a foundation text. Isaiah 51, and start from verse 12. I, even I, says the Lord, of course, this is the Lord speaking, Yahweh. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die and of the son of a man who will be made like grass. The fear, of a, the fear of man brings a snare. Amen? The fear of the Lord brings liberty and life and honor and riches and all the good blessings of God and keeps you clean from evil. But the fear of man brings bondage, a snare. And he's talking here about a situation of oppression where the people of God are being oppressed by a wicked power. You see, there are wicked powers in the earth, and I'm not talking about demonic powers or satanic powers. Uh, they influence the powers that I'm talking about. Wicked powers, I'm talking about wicked governments. Wicked structures of authority. You might work for a company that's wicked. Amen? You might work for uh, a government or a civic council or a local authority, and you discover that it's wicked because the people running it are wicked. And it's, here's the thing about the wicked. The devil likes them to be, to rise up through the ranks, and they like to rise through the ranks so that you end up being governed, ruled, by evil, wicked, ungodly wretches. And that's where we are in the nations today. That's where we are in Scotland, that's where we are in Britain. And a lot of them have happy, smelling faces and jolly personalities. I'm not talking about Nicola Sturgeon there, but Boris. You say, well, you know, what's wrong with Boris? If you need to be told, you need to come to this meeting. And, and incidentally, you know, I, I asked the Lord some time back, before, when Boris was in the political wilderness, I said, Lord, who's the next Prime Minister? And he said to me, Boris Johnson. And at that time... In the natural, that man had not even a hope of being anywhere near government. And then the Lord said to me, my servant Johnson. So I thought, oh, we're going to get a man who's going to do mighty things for God. Glory, hallelujah, get this, get this present prime minister out, get Boris in. And you know, I think that maybe God had that purpose for Boris. But when God says, my servant Johnson, that doesn't necessarily mean that Boris is going to be in Holy Ghost prayer meetings, speaking in tongues and preaching from the pulpit. It simply means that he, he may perform a task that God has purposed him to do. And I think that task was Brexit. And I think the best thing for Britain right now would be Boris out at number 10. 
Anyway, let's read on. I, even I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die and of the son of a man who will be made like grass? And that's talking about living under an oppressive, fear-filled culture and atmosphere like we are today in Britain. And you forget, Yahweh, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You have feared continually every day when you wore your masks, when you got your vaccines, when you were afraid to stand within two meters of somebody at Asda. You have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor. And I shared this, and I'll share it again, because the Lord had me study this. The Lord said to me, do you know the vaccine's in this verse? And it is. Because that word fury means poison. It means poison that can kill you. So we could say because of the poison of the oppressor. Who's the oppressor? The government. What's the poison? Do you need to be told? Thank God tonight we don't have anybody in that's got a question mark over them. But I'd still be preaching it, folks. Because of the poison of the oppressor, when he has prepared to destroy, that means it was pre-planned, it was a pandemic. He is prepared to destroy. Not just, oh, it was accidental. Oh, we accidentally uh, injected millions of you with something that we weren't sure of. No, they were sure. They prepared to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Where is it? Well, we're not taking it. And the Lord is saying, a lot of fear out there, and there's stuff to fear, but he's saying, it's only if you forget Yahweh, your maker. Amen? And I'm sad to say that I know men of God and women of God who I would have said were maybe even more fervent than me, maybe lived holier lives than me, you know, but they forgot the Lord, their maker. And they're sitting tonight with a, a poison running through every cell of their body. And we're not knocking that. We're not looking down our nose on these people. We're not being haughty and, and gloating over them. We're not doing that. Probably everybody in here has loved ones who have taken this vaccine. And it, it, it breaks your heart. But anyway, let's press on. Then it says this, the captive exile hastens that he may be loosed. Or what that really means in, in you know, non-flowery language is, the captive exile is desperate to be set free. The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed. Now, what's a captive exile? Well, in English, it's a bit of an oxymoron. Or an oxymoron. Now, we all know some morons, but this is an oxymoron. Because a captive exile, if you're captive, you're locked in. And if you're in exile, you're locked out. But this describes lockdown. See, this is my point with this passage. And I have to say this every time I preach it. I've been preaching it a lot lately. But I used to preach it for years and years and years. And people would look at me like going, what's he talking about? Because we're living in a free society. But not anymore. Because when I preached it, it was prophetic. And now I'm preaching it, it's not prophetic. It's reality. The captive exile, what does it mean? Well, in lockdown, we were exiled because we were locked out of our normal world. We were locked out of our churches. We were locked out of shops. We were locked out of meeting our family. We were locked out of life. But we were also captives because we were locked in. And lockdown covers captive exile just perfect, doesn't it? And we were desperate to get out, desperate to get back to normality. But here's the bad news. Normality as we knew it is over. We're never going back to that. And I want to say this tonight, hallelujah, because it was an illusion. Here's why. Because the people that locked us down were in power before they locked us down. And they had every intention of locking us down. And the people that controlled them, the people, the, the invisible strength, not so invisible, but the people who controlled, the puppeteers who controlled the Borises and the Nicolas and all these, these people had this plan going for a long, long time. So that the illusion was that we had freedom. The illusion was that we could do things that we wanted. We could go where we wanted. We could travel. We could go to shops. We could go to church. 
That was an illusion. We were captive exiles, but we just hadn't opened the prison yet. And so all those times I was preaching, people, some people maybe thought I was nuts. But they know better now. They're listening to the Billy Boy now. Or not, because they don't like to be reminded that when they listened before, they thought I was nuts. That he should not die in the pit. What's, what's, what, is the, what is the big bondage in planet Earth? The Bible tells us. The fear, of, the fear of death is the master fear. And people are terrified. You know, when you walk into a shop without a mask on, oh my goodness, the looks you get or the remarks that you get. That he should not die in the pit because people are terrified of death. And it says, and that his bread should not fail. What else are they scared of? Losing their livelihood, losing their, um, you know, this all week long we've heard about this 20 pound that people were going to lose or have now lost. Because people are afraid that they'll lose their bread, they'll lose their livelihood, they'll lose their money. They won't have money to live on. And it's a real fear. So this is describing planet Earth in, the, in 2020, 2021. Why? Well, Isaiah was a prophet and he prophesied about the last days. The last 26 chapters or something of the book are all about the last days, pretty much. And of God's people in the isles or the ends of the earth. And we're going to look at that in a minute as well. This is just introductory to where I want to go over this series of messages. Well, what's God's answer? Well, here it is. It says, but I am Yahweh, your God. God's answer to all the fear, the pandemic, the virus, the desperation, all of that. But I am Yahweh, your God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared. Yahweh of hosts is his name, or Yahweh of heaven's angelic armies who can crush all their foes, all your foes, in an instant. That's who I am, he says. That's, see, his answer is, I'm here. I am. I'm Yahweh. Your God. Notice he didn't just say, I am Yahweh God. He says, I'm Yahweh your God. Isn't it good to know if God be for us, nobody can be against us? And then this is the commission verse of our ministry. But look at it. And he says, and here's the answer. Here's your answer. What's your answer to the pandemic tonight? What's your answer to COVID-19? What's your answer to... We'll be kind and call it government overreach, but then we won't be so kind and just call it tyranny. He says, I've put my words in your mouth and I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. And that means, that's a, a metaphor for the Holy Ghost, for the power of God, the, the hand of God. And that's why when we put the capsule up in Shehalian uh, 11 years ago, we put... The, uh, a picture of, of the hand of, of God in the capsule. Because it says, in this mount, the hand of Yahweh will rest. Amen? Because on the mount, the hand of God will rest. And there are other scriptural references to the hand of God in relation to Shehalion. And I mean very, very, very specific ones. We'll look at that maybe another time. So he says, I've covered you with the shadow of my hand. I've given, you, I've given you the word and I've given you the Holy Ghost. I've given you the Spirit of God, the fire of God. I've given you these things. I've covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. We're Zion tonight. The remnant of God are Zion or is Zion. You try and get it grammatically correct, but you could say both. The remnant are Zion, the remnant is Zion, we are the Zion of God. And, and that means we are the people, we are the people. And that's not triggering all you Rangers fans. We are the people of God. It says, I may plant the heavens. How are you going to plant the heavens? Through his words in your mouth, through his engulfing you and enveloping you with his spirit. In other words, as you walk as an effective remnant believer as a saint of God and we're going to look at something that's going to electrify you in a minute about that as you do that he will plant the heavens that means establish his kingdom that's what it means on the earth where we're all around as Babylon 
We're all around this darkness, and Cam's just shared stuff about Babylon and our WhatsApp group. And we need to know who Babylon is, what Babylon is. We need to know it so that, and, and by the way, it's easily identified because it's all around us. But it's, he says, I'll plant my kingdom, I'll establish it, and I will lay the foundation of the earth. And you know, you can't lay foundations until you've cleared away the, the rubbish. Cleared away the existing building. And the existing building is Antichrist, Babylon, Leviathan, and all of that. He says, I'm going to, it's going to be a new society, a new culture. It's going to be big in Bible college, teaching all that about transforming society, invading the seven mountains, transforming them, bringing them into subjection to Mount Zion. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be taller and higher and greater than all the other mountains and all the people of the earth and all those other mountains will come to Mount Zion and say, teach us your ways, O Lord. And guess who's going to be waiting on Mount Zion to teach them? You and I. And I long for the day when we, we, the door goes and it's the first minister or the prime minister or other national leaders saying, we're bankrupt of ideas and money, but you guys have it all. And that's, if you believe this word, that's what's going to happen. If you believe what God says, that's exactly what's going to happen. And say to Zion, you are my people. In fact, it says over in, it says, uh, over in Revelation chapter 3 about the Philadelphia church, the end time Philadelphia church, it says the synagogue of Satan will come down, come to you and bow down at your feet and say, you are the people God loves. You are Zion. You are the ones. Isaiah chapter 60, Revelation chapter 3. It's coming, folks. Right now they might say, see those mental Christians. But on that day, they say they're not so mental. That's where we get this phrase, planting the heavens. So, um, I just want to lay a groundwork tonight. Don't really want to preach the same message as I did yesterday, but I think we may just touch, if we've got a wee bit of time, we may touch on the strategy. Because yesterday's message at Arise Scotland was planting the heavens, the kingdom strategy for governance and dominion. God has a strategy. We might get into that tonight, what we do if we've got time. But before we do, I want to look at a couple of verses. First of all, in Psalm 135. Okay, Psalm 135. And it's and this, this I hope, electrifies you. We'll read this verse, then we'll read the other verse where it's mentioned, then I'll tell you what it means, okay? Verse, Psalm 135. And verse 5 says, For I know that Yahweh is great and our Lord is above all gods. Okay, and that says in Hebrew, I know that Yahweh is great and our Lord will be Adonai. So he's saying that Yahweh is great and Jesus, who is Adonai, is above all gods. Isn't that good news? Well, what about all these gods? What about all this, you know? Well, what about it? He's above them all. And if you're seated with him in heavenly places, so are you. If they're beneath his feet, they're beneath your feet. And God is waiting. You see, we're, wait or we're waiting on God to send revival. God is waiting for a people who know who they are and who will find out who they are and exercise and implement who they are. And then we won't have to worry about COVID-19 and COP26. And they've got all these coding. It's like a James Bond film. And by the way, the latest James Bond film reflects what we're going through right now. Because the problem in the James Bond film is that a government agency, MI6, has invented something that will depopulate the earth and its nanobots um, targeting your DNA. Sound familiar? Amen. Not, well, not amen, but you understand. He says, verse 6, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all deep places. Now watch this verse, watch this. He causes, this is verse 7, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. 
He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Now, I didn't see lightning the other day on the mount, but I saw wind and rain and amen. But look what it says. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. Now, I said this on the mount, and you know, I'm, I'm just going to be honest and say, when we were on the mount and we were doing what we were doing, saying what we were saying, praying what we were praying, we did see, because we couldn't see the summit, and when we were kind of were finished, the clouds lifted, and we saw the summit. But I also saw other clouds that weren't the same. It was, and I said, I think, the cloud of witnesses is here. Amen? And I believe that. And in fact, on the morning before we went up to uh, Persia, uh, we went to get some supplies or something, and I remember th- I could actually literally feel spiritual forces above, above my head, battling, in, 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 if truth be told. So we were in a combat zone, spiritually speaking. But turn with me to I, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 51. And you're going to see this little phrase again. But in Jeremiah chapter 50, in Jeremiah chapter 51, the prophet is speaking about the end time. Well, he's actually speaking about two things. First of all, the coming destruction of Babylon, literal Babylon, back then in uh, the old covenant days. But he also is speaking forward to the end time destruction of Babylon. And that's where I think John borrows maybe some of his language from, from the prophet Jeremiah. And it's clear that Jeremiah isn't just talking about the destruction of literal literal Babylon. He's talking about a future thing too. And look what he says. Look what he says. Watch this. And, And we could read it all, but read it yourself because we don't really have time. That Jeremiah chapter 51 and fifth chapter 50, 51 is all about God's pronouncements through Jeremiah of this destruction of Babylon. Look at what he says in verse 15. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heaven by his understanding. We're talking about planting the heavens. We're talking about God stretching out the heavens. We're talking about God laying new foundations for the earth through his people. Watch this, verse 16. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. And I can tell you there was a multitude of waters in the heavens and on the earth the other day, weren't there? And has been all for quite some time. Watch this. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, first of all, let me explain the phrase, the ends of the earth. Isaiah uses it. Jeremiah uses it. It's quite a common term. But for us living in 21st century Scotland or the Western world, when we hear the phrase, or the ends of the earth, we just tend to think, oh, you know, as far as you can go. Oh, it's the far-flung corners of the globe and all that type of thing. And you might get specific, oh, probably means Australia, or, you know, to us it might mean. Does that make sense? Or away, Alaska, and Siberia, you know, far, far away, India, China. But that's not what it meant to people living in Bible times. Because the ends of the earth wasn't a vague, generic, sort of, oh, well, far away term. It was a specific geographical term. And they understood it to mean when you said the ends of the earth or the isles, sometimes translated coastlands, they understood it to mean in the northwesterly direction from Israel or Palestine or whatever you want to call it. As far as you could go, and literally what it meant was the British Isles. The ends of the earth were known as the British Isles or the north. West coastlands of Europe, but really, generally speaking, the British Isles. And the Romans had a term for it, Ultima Thule, the end of the world. 
Okay? And it meant really as far as you could go, as, as far as you could sail. And that was to folks back in the Middle East a, a good distance. Still is today. Even on a plane. And back then, of course, they, they did have very advanced shipping. A lot more advanced than we think they had. And so they would regularly come to the British Isles to trade. Solomon ships did it. The Phoenicians. And so it was, it was, it was a destination. And that, that lends itself to the tradition that Jesus came here with Joseph of Arimathea, who was the Roman um, uh, minister of mines and mining. One of the wealthiest men in the world at that time. So, let me just put it another way. Let me put it with that context in mind. He causes the vapours... Remember, this is in the context of the destruction of Babylon. And there's a literal destruction of Babylon that followed from this. But there's also, and scholars will tell you this, he's talking also about end-time Babylon. And John's writings reflect this. Reflect this. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Yeah? John took that phrase. Now, you could say it this way. He causes vapours to arise from the ends of the earth, from Britain, or specifically, really, from Scotland. Because, you know, the Romans built two walls, Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall, and scholars used to believe that they built the walls to keep the, the mad pits from coming south. They, they built the walls to stop people coming south into England. But now scholars have revised that and said, well, you know, if you look at the walls and you look at the architecture and so on, the Romans weren't building walls to keep people from coming south. They were building walls to keep people from going north. Because the Romans believed that the further north you went in Britain, it was holy land. They literally believed it was holy land. And they believed what we call today Scotland, the territory of Scotland, was the holiest, most sacred land you could get. So the walls were built to keep people from going and defiling Scotland. Not that it was Scotland at that time, but the territory, the land. So the ends of the earth, in, in very real Bible terms, we would say was, was Scotland. And we shared this yesterday, and, and, and folks, folks knew that because they knew it anyway. It says here then, the vapours... He causes the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. Let's just have a little bit of license with this and say he causes the vapours to ascend from Scotland. Amen? But that still doesn't really mean much, does it? Because if you're saying, well, he causes the vapours to ascend, meaning that, uh, and then he's talking about lightnings and winds, you're talking about Scottish weather, aren't you? Clouds, rain. All of that stuff. So we would say, oh yeah, oh yes, amen. But, and here's where it should electrify you, brothers and sisters. That word vapours in the Hebrew, here's what it means. Go and check it out. Get your strongs, your youngs. It means kings. It means rulers. It means army captains, leaders. What mighty warriors. We were just talking about that, weren't we, Ronnie? Mighty warriors. That's what it means. It means great and mighty men like David had. Kings, rulers, chiefs, captains. That's what it means in Hebrew. So let's read it again. It's the same phrase used in Psalm 135, did I say? He causes kings, rulers, or let's just add our New Testament idea into it, he causes king priests because that's the meaning in Hebrew kings to ascend or arise from Scotland now listen I'm not making this stuff up you can check this out by going and studying it out for yourself he causes people who know how to govern and rule in the heavenlies to rise up Arise Scotland. When, when we asked the Lord, what are we going to call this thing? The Lord gave Agnes the, the name Arise Scotland. 
Amen. Arise and shine for your light has come. See, if you don't arise, then, and, and the reason you have to arise is, you wouldn't be told to arise unless you were in a place you shouldn't be. Amen? So you can't function in what God wants you to function in until you know who you are. And when you know who you are, you will arise and you'll say, I'm not seated in this church tonight. I'm not sitting in the bus. I'm not sitting on a sofa at home. I'm sitting together with him in heavenly places in Christ. Amen? So he causes kings to arise from the ends of the earth. You know, that's why our lion rampant that we have up there, as you see, has got a crown. That is the royal standard of Scotland. That's the royal emblem of Scotland. And did you know that, that that's a Judai emblem? And yeah, I, I, I could get into all that. I mean, I'd love to get into it, but that's not the purpose of what I'm talking about tonight. But that is the line of the of Judah. And Scotland has two lines. And one is a red line. And the red line signifies Jesus in Psalm, sorry, Revelation 19, where his vestures dipped in blood. And there's two aspects to that. First of all, it's the blood of his enemies. But we also know that he, his blood was shed. So he came as the Redeemer and gave his blood when he's also the warring uh, Lion of Judah and his vestures dipped in his, the blood of his enemies. And we, we see that in Isaiah as well, that, that he came from Edom and he was drenched in blood. But there's also the golden lion. And the golden lion speaks of his glory. And we know him in all those aspects, don't we? We know him as saviour, redeemer. We know him as mighty warrior, fighting for us. And we also know him as the king of glory. And I want to say this to you. We need to start understanding more and more that being in being Scotland, being in Scotland and being Scottish, it's just the best thing. And that's, that's not being... You know, we're not going to be starting up an SNP branch in here. Let me assure you, we're definitely not. But, but you know, here's, here's why. Independence isn't God's best for Scotland. What we're talking about today is leading the nations. Scotland's destiny is to be chief of the nations. Not by having a bigger army and military and all that, but because, we're, because we are a called out people. A holy nation separated unto him. You know, you don't need armies and navies and nuclear deterrents even. Although we do have that, thank God, in a sense, yeah. We don't need that stuff to be safe. We simply need to be a people who say, we are yours, Lord. Amen? So, anyway, that's just stuff that I thought would uh, bless you. Just very quickly... I just want to cover, there's a lot to cover here, and I don't, want to, I don't have time anyway now to preach what I preached yesterday. But I do want to just close maybe with, with revealing to you the strategy that I did reveal, that the Lord had given me. And I got it through reading this lady's book, Anna, Anna sorry, Mendez Ferrell. Um, and I know Isabel has been reading this book, she got it my recommendation, and being blessed. And this is a wonderful lady of God. Her and her husband, their stuff's amazing. Okay? But she spoke in the book, and I'm just going to very quickly cover it. Turn to Titus 1 verse 5, and I think we'll, we'll kind of leave it there for tonight. Uh, but I just want to look at that and then just explain to you what the Lord showed me as I read this book. Because we're talking about, in effect, God is saying that he's going to raise up mighty rulers. You know, and I, I don't think we did too bad in the mount the other day. Decreeing. We weren't just decreeing from a mountain as they were wet and soaked and, and all that. Peat, well, it wasn't peat, but it was, it was mucky anyway. Amen? Was there peat? I don't know. Don't think there was. No. <laughs> we weren't just doing that just because it was a fun thing to do. We were doing it because we were instructed by the Lord to do it. 
And I believe it's because God is saying to us at this time, I'm going to raise up people in Scotland who are going to be mighty and who are going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That hundred-year prophecy speaks about the man-child coming to Scotland and that corporate body of overcomers and that, in effect, the remnant in Scotland become that man-child body. And that's you, everybody here in this room, if you'll receive it and walk in it. And be God's corporate body of governance, not in, just in Scotland, but in Britain and in the earth. Now, Titus 1.5 and Paul speaks to Titus. Let's just read from verse 4. To Titus, a true son and a common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Saviour. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. So what Paul was saying was, he left this guy Titus, which is a great name, isn't it? Who'd like to be called Titus? Titus. Maybe not the ladies, but... He says, I left you there for a purpose, Titus. Because there was something missing. It wasn't just quite complete. Does anybody get that feeling? That, that there's things missing? So how do we get into this? How are oh, these vapours, these chiefs, these rulers, these kings? In actual fact, one of the words that could be translated uh, for the word vapours is shakes. You know, like as in the shake of Arabi, you know, that, you know. And it's because these shakes have enormous wealth and enormous power. The power of life and death over their people. God isn't playing games with us. So he says, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking. There's things missing, you have to do it. And appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And that's a little phrase, and that's what Anna Mendez Ferrell speaks about. That's what leapt out at me. Appoint elders in every city. And that's shouted in my spirit. Appoint elders in every city. I'm going to rattle through this. We've only got a few minutes. Here's what she said. Anna Mendez Ferrell said this. Understanding the place of elders is key in the kingdom of God. Now, of course, it is synonymous with the word bishop, um, which is, uh, it speaks about later in the chapter, which, that's the King James anyway. It means overseer, Okay. Uh, there's overseers in the body of Christ, pastors or whatever. But I want to concentrate on this word elder very quickly in the little time we've got left to show you what I believe the Lord's saying to us. It's the Greek word presbyteros. All right? And with a comprehension we us when we hear the word elders to think of them as a group of leaders maybe under a senior pastor or minister. You know, like the guys that hand you the hymn book when you get into church. Or the open the door, good morning, how are you? And they all seem to have grey suits and shirts and ties, yeah? You know, that Church of Scotland, the elder thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But it falls far short of what God, I believe, would have of an elder. And Anna Mendez Ferrell says, Elders are the key component to bring the kingdom of God into the earth. As Paul established churches during his travelling, he assigned elders over the cities and not pastors over congregations. We hear a lot about church planting, and oh, you know, churches need a pastor. But Paul didn't say that. He didn't say appoint pastors over churches and plant churches. He said appoint elders in every city. And when we understand what elders means, and it ties in with what we've just heard, he causes vapors. Now, vapors are not. This is the thing about vapors as leaders. Vapors are not, vapors rise. Vapors are not earthbound, are they? Jesus said, a man that's born again in the spirit is like the wind. You can't grasp him because he's not from this dimension. Vapors have that otherworldly, like the cloud of witnesses, yeah? And she says this, she says, uh, it's not pastors over congregations, it's elders over cities. We know that these Elders had an oversight function in the churches because the verses following this tell us that they were bishops or overseers. And according to her, there's a strong case to be made, take note of this, that we have mistakenly limited these leaders called elders to a role in the four walls of church while God's purpose is far wider in scope and strategic in implementation. In other words, elders are not to be 
bound in church, they are to be pillars in the community, they are to be salt and light in the community, they are to have authority in the community and a voice. Amen? So God is raising up leaders like that who will invade the, the seven mountains of culture and transform them. You know, think about John Knox. John Knox wasn't just preaching in a wee country church. He took a nation. That's what God has in mind. And the, this lady goes on to say this. Elders have a burden and comprehension about their city and also about their God-given authority to rule over it alongside other elders. They don't think in terms of my congregation or my network, but in terms of God's kingdom being established in every area of society within the city and how they are the ones responsible to make it happen as a team. Now, I'm going to run out of time here. But the Bible does say, remember, we're kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And elders, of course, simply means uh, somebody older and mature. And it doesn't just mean, it does mean the literal, an old guy, an old lady, but it also means mature. So you could be a mature Christian, but be still quite young physically. Does that make sense? So especially an Israelite Sanhedrist or a member of the Celestial Council, we didn't look at it, but Revelation chapter 4 go and 5, go and read it. The 24 elders are around the throne, and that's key to this. The 24 elders represent mature saints governing from the throne room of God. Um, and you can be an earth and do that because you know where you are. You're sitting together with him. Let me just close this by saying this. It also means of rank or positions of responsibility and authority, heads of tribes, leaders of tribes and families, and overseer of churches, of course. And it reminds us of the Sanhedrin because the same word is used for Jewish elders of the Sanhedrin as is used for elders in churches. And the grand Sanhedrin met in Jerusalem, but here's the key to this, okay? There were 71 elders in the great Sanhedrin, but it said that they had Sanhedrins in every city of 23 elders, and they were judges over the people. They were in seats of authority. So when he says appoint elders in every city, he's not saying, have, have some guys hand out handbooks. Have some guys greet people at the door. Have some guys take the, the collection plate round. He was saying appoint leaders who will influence every city and take authority over it in prayer. Amen. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? The Sanhedrin comes from a Greek word which means sitting together. And we are sitting together tonight in the heavenly Sanhedrin, aren't we? The council, the ecclesia of God in heaven, every one of us. If you don't walk in that, you'll never experience it. But if you do, then you'll walk in authority. And here's the thing that, that and, and that we'll close with this, or definitely we'll close with this. This is the thing that really electrified me as we were up the mount the other day. It said the Sanhedrin had powers greater than lesser courts. They had powers that were greater than lesser courts because they were dealing with higher matters. They weren't just dealing with, they were dealing with civic matters, but they were also dealing on a level. They understand maybe spiritual, the soul of the nation. And here's what it says. They had powers that lesser courts did not have. For example, they could put the king on trial. They could summon the king and say, you are ruling unrighteously. And we judge you and here is the penalty. And they had the authority to do that. Now, brothers and sisters, that's what we did the other day. That's what we do when we pray for the nation. We take authority. And we don't need to have an election. We don't need to, you know, we, and we certainly don't need to get our pitchforks and our rifles out and start a militia and stage a coup and all that. We do it with decrees that come out of our mouths and say in the name of Jesus, pull this Wicked ruler down. Remove them and replace them with the godly. Why? Because we are elders in God's Sanhedrin, which in New Testament terms is Ecclesia, the church. Amen? But if you don't want to walk in that and you want to read your everyday with Jesus, 
you know, and, and just stay at that nice level of just being a nice Christian. We don't get into all that stuff. Oh, that's heavy duty, all that, you know. If you want to stay at that level, and I know nobody in this room is at that level because you're hungry for this high calling. God doesn't have a low calling, but he does have a high calling. But a lot of people want to stay at that lower level and get their daily bread and all these wee books and read their wee, you know, what's it, devotionals. And just stay there and talk about, you know, God is love and we just need to love everybody. And that's the answer. But we don't become what God wants us to become, which is a chief, a ruler, a king, a priest, or a king priest rather, and be who God has called us to be and rule and reign with him. It's time that we stepped into that, folks. Praise the Lord.